We've had some great guests on Tisky Sour this year, from Yanis Varoufakis to Namiki Konst, from Anna Kasparian to the late Michael Brooks. One of my favourite interviews was with Liz and Brace from the True and On podcast. They came on in July, which was the month that Ghislaine Maxwell, one of Jeffrey Epstein's closest associates, was arrested. Liz and Brace explained to me why the official narrative when it comes to Jeffrey Epstein contains more than a few holes. That story isn't wrong. It's just incomplete. And perhaps like the best place to start with where it's incomplete is talking about Jeffrey's background. Now, Jeffrey kind of came out of nowhere. He is a two-time, was a two-time college dropout who was hired um, basically when he was a taxi driver to be a uh, school teacher at the Dalton School, which is a very fancy private school on the Upper East Side, very, very wealthy. Um, and But he was hired by a man named Donald Barr, who is the father of current attorney general in America, William Barr. Now, that relationship aside, which is very, um, let's say, unique, uh, you know, Donald Barr is also an ex-OSS agent, the OSS being the precursor to the CIA. So you've got an ex-intelligence agent hiring this man out of nowhere, no college degree, plops him into high society. And from there, he, he gets hired uh, as an investment banker on Wall Street. Now, so this, all of this stuff aside is like very much missing from the story. Wouldn't you say, Brace? Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, the, the fact that like, I think just the, the fact that Donald Barr's son is now the person who's overseeing basically the investigation into to Epstein uh, post-mortem uh, is is Whoa. astounding. Yeah, exactly. And so there's that there's I mean, that's that's a it's a very strange shape that makes. Yeah. There. But 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 just the the intense involvement of people connected to various intelligence agencies basically all down the line here is astounding. I mean, Epstein himself used to tell people that he was something like a bag man for the CIA. That he was, he described himself as a financial bounty hunter who would, I, I guess, go get money that was the CIA maybe gave to the wrong warlord or something. It's very unclear what happened there. But, but Ghislaine, when she enters his life in the early 90s, uh, following the passing of her father, who, of course, you guys are British, so you know Robert Maxwell, um, former labor MP, uh, and, uh, <laughs> former um, head of a giant media conglomerate there who stole his employees' pensions. And of course, famously, allegedly, a spy for the for the Mossad for Israeli's intelligence services, and a guy who really liked to sort of play in that world as well. A former member of British intelligence too during World War II, where he allegedly executed a German uh, officer. Which honestly, that's fine with me. You know, I mean, there's a book written about Robert Maxwell calling him Israel's super spy. The daughter of this guy enters Epstein's life in 1991. And, and from there, he really takes off. She introduces him to all kinds of people in high society, right? Because, because Ghislaine, when she was younger, uh, she, you know, she grew up friends with the royal family. She has a lot of high society contacts. She went to Oxford. She gets to New York. They, they, the kind of the story there is that she's penniless, but obviously not true. She flew on a damn Concord jet. And she starts introducing Epstein to people that, you know, he was rich at this point. But that he might not have otherwise known, and and we'd be remiss not to mention too that Epstein's money—it is really unclear where it came from. He doesn't seem to have actually worked at all after uh, he was basically given uh, rights to this this American billionaire Leslie Wexter's money, and so. Their relationship continues. Epstein kind of goes further and further up in high society. He's hanging out with the Clintons. Ghislaine's having dinner alone with Bill Clinton in, in New York. He's meeting basically every kind of rich and famous person you could ever dream of. And uh, he's introducing a lot of them, allegedly, to very young girls. And another thing about, about Jeffrey Epstein, and this has been testified about over and over and over and over again, is that all of his properties were wired up with cameras, every single room. Mm. I mean, that links to one of the leading theories as well, right? So I just want to I just want to focus on that money thing just as, as a sort of summary in a way. If, if you watch the Netflix documentary, the story it tells you is that he became one of the richest men in America, essentially by being charming. So yeah. sort of like he didn't get yeah. a degree, but he charmed someone's parent into getting him a job at Bear Stearns. And then at Bear Stearns, he charmed this, yeah, this other 
this guy who owned the clothes firm to sort of give him billions and billions of pounds. And you're sort of watching it thinking, like, fuck, this guy must have been so charming to end up with <laughs> yeah. the most valuable townhouse in New yes. York. And the only thing he's got is this sort of, in, it did, it, the story doesn't sound particularly yeah. viable to me. Um, but in any case, you just brought up, yeah, there that the, these secret cameras. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, the leading theories or the leading alternate theories um, about Jeffrey Epstein is it's not that he was sort of a, a rogue financier and was let off the hook because he was he was powerful but his role in the establishment was to sort of involve other elites in these crimes um, and then potentially to film them so the idea is yeah. it might have been a honey trap either you know to personally enrich themselves to blackmail people after having filmed them doing stuff or they were working for secret services um, who wanted compromat on, yes. on people a lot of people forget this but when jeffrey was Shortly after Jeffrey was arrested, uh, right before his untimely demise in New York, the FBI, when they were raiding his property, they said they found and confiscated uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tapes, what I'm assuming were probably CDs or DVDs or Blu-ray, God knows what <laughs> what what uh, setup he had. But, uh, and they were all labeled, uh, what they say is, you know, person's name, man's name, plus girl's name. By the way, there has been no mention of where these tapes are or where um, like any of that uh, evidence is. No one has even remarked on it since. No one in the media has asked any official about it. Um, we haven't heard anything. But the fact that those exist tells us that those that the tapings or the video tapes uh, that he was accumulating, that there was a purpose there. Now you can speculate and say, okay, was it on behalf of someone else? Was it just to kind of cover his bases? Was it kind of a, you know, I think we are of the opinion that it's kind of a mix of both where it's like you keep this because you know what's going on in case you need it later. And this is something that I hear you mention on the show is your is the way you value tabloids. And I think this sort of leads into an interesting <laughs> discussion about the media. So this is from The Sun. Ghislaine Maxwell and her paedophile lover, Jeffrey Epstein, were both Israeli spies who took pictures of powerful men having sex with underage girls to blackmail them, their alleged Mossad handler has sensationally claimed. I suppose why uh, the fact this getting reported in The Sun potentially, you know, messes with some of the conspiracy theories basically is that the, the conspiracy theory is that the media aren't covering it because they're scared to or because they're friends with the same people or because they're implicated etc cetera, etc cetera. but then why would the sun be able to publish that because they're as you know they're as wound up with the establishment as, as anyone else so why is it only the tabloids that can put this out there because obviously the alternative theory or the, the mainstream theory is that the reason the sun can publish it is because you need less evidence and they can do these sort of salacious scandal stories so what's your explanation of why the kind of things you investigate on your podcast are more likely to be in a tabloid than the new york times we actually did i think maybe a segment on the show or maybe i just meant to do a segment on the show about how incorrect the sun was uh, on so many different points of this. They, at different points, within like a four-month period, said Ghislaine was in an apartment in France. She was in a chateau in France. She was being moved uh, throughout the Midwest by a crack team of Navy SEALs. And I think like two or three other places. So there's been a lot of misreporting there as well. The Sun in particular also is, I believe, owned by Rupert Murdoch, uh, yeah. if, I'm, if I'm not incorrect. Rupert Murdoch and Ghislaine's father, Robert Maxwell, did not get along very mm. well. And maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. Um, I think that what the thing is, is like a lot of like serious reporters don't maybe feel comfortable really putting the dots together, or maybe they're told they're not able to put the dots together, or maybe, maybe they're sort of their training, which this is sort of the theory that I'm uh, more sympathetic to is that the, the train of, of a lot of these so-called serious reporters prevents them from from putting this kind of stuff together because they're taught to think of this as the realm of conspiracy theory and that, that everything is actually much more simple than it seems and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the most charitable inter interpretation of it. I have other interpretations. I'm sure people can put, put together themselves, particularly we value the tabloids before the Jeffrey Epstein stuff. Um, <laughs> grew up. Like old page six columns. We have taken, uh, we've learned a lot from them. Um, uh, page six is like a, 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 a sort of society column in in our, one of our gossip magazines, the New York or tabloid type magazines, the New York Post. 
because that will report a lot of stuff like the fact that Ghislaine was was seen having having dinner um with 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 Bill Clinton in in New York City we take it we, we learn a lot from that kind of stuff I think too like you know we should you know remind people that I mean I don't know if they're aware of this in the UK I think it made a splash over there but um there was a leaked video that came out of a American news anchor Amy Robach uh, it was like a, she was caught on a hot mic, basically. Mm -hmm. I love saying that hot mic, um, where she was saying that she had the Epstein story back in spring of 2015 and that she had everything. She had the accusers. Um, she had everything. You know, they implicated some very powerful people. She mentions Bill Clinton. I believe she mentions, I believe she mentions in the video Prince Andrew. She does. Um, and, you know, she said that it got completely shut down by the network. And we should remember that, you know, what was happening in America and the UK in spring 2015? Okay, well, we were months out from Hillary Clinton announcing her candidacy for presidency, for the presidency, and there was a royal baby about to be born. And so you've got two very powerful, <laughs> you know, political families in their own right, in different respects, that have the ability to withhold access on major stories in order to get the mainstream press, as we would call it, not to cover stuff. And that's something that liter li like literally happened. Now, do I know if those conversations happened? No, I don't know. I'm speculating. But I think you can kind of line up some things where you've got, you've got a case that implicates some very, very powerful people and there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons why those people want to keep it out of outlets that normal, everyday, you know, Americans or, you know, any, you know, any population would find reputable. It's easy to dismiss the tabloids. Oh, it's The Sun. Who cares? Oh, it's New York Post. It's gossip. It's harder to discredit ABC News or The New York Times or The Washington Post. This is Prince Andrew. Let's take a look. One of Epstein's accusers, Virginia Roberts, yeah. has made allegations against you. She was very specific about that night. Mm -hmm. She described dancing with you no. and you profusely sweating <laughs> and that she went on to have bath, there's a, there's possibly... A, there's a slight problem with, 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 with the sweating um, because uh, I, I have a peculiar medical condition, which is that I don't sweat um, or I didn't sweat at the time, and that was, oh, was she? Yes, I didn't sweat at the time because I um, ha had suffered what I would describe as an overdose of adrenaline in the Falklands War when I was shot at, uh, and I simply, it, it, was, it, was, it was almost impossible for me to, to, to sweat. Do you remember dancing at Tramp? No, that couldn't have happened because the date that there's being suggested I was at home with the children. You know that you were at home with the children. Mm. Was it a memorable night? On that particular day that, that, that um, uh, uh, we now understand is the date, which is the 10th of March, uh, I was at home. Uh, I was with the children. I'd taken Beatrice to uh, a Pizza Express in Woking for a party at, a, I suppose, sort of four or five in the afternoon. Why would you remember that so specifically? Why would you remember a, a Pizza Express birthday and being at home? Because going to Pizza Express in Woking is an unusual thing for me to do. A very unusual thing for me to do. I've never been, I've only been to Woking a couple of times um, and I remember it weirdly distinctly. But as soon as somebody reminded me of it, I went, oh yes, I remember that. I'll explain why that for me is evidence. Well, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting on the fence here, but why it could be evidence that Deep State is not involved. Because presumably, if this was a big cover up that they don't want to unravel, they'd give him some good lines. And you can say a bunch of things about the CIA, the MI5, whatever, Mossad. Are they that dumb that he'd say, how, how do I how do I stop this all unraveling? And they say you couldn't sweat because of the Falklands War. And then you went to Pizza Express when you were supposed to be <laughs> having sex with an underage minor. I forgot about the Pizza Express line. I always remember the sweat, but the Pizza Express one is like the real wow. cherry on top. I think a couple of things about that. I would say that I would push back on the idea that there is like one single like single subject that's driving 
like something here where there it's like one body that's controlling and manipulating all of these moving parts. I don't think that's true. But I also think that, you know, and I hope I'm not offending anyone here, but I don't think Prince Andrew is perhaps maybe the sharpest tool in the box. And I would imagine that, you know, they know, okay, well, he's already pretty well implicated. And there is quite possibly some documents coming out next week that might uh, implicate him even further, which we can get to. But, you know, in the same way that they kind of like let him, like kind of cut him loose. Because the other thing to remember here too, is that like the United States is never going to, like the, the United States is never going to indict Prince Andrew on any, like that that is out of the realm of possibility. Like it would be, uh, completely unheard of for the United States government to indict a, a member of the royal family. Like, it's just not going to happen. And so, like, I think that, you know, his, uh, you know, clearly very bad PR team aside, like the sweat argument and the Pizza Express, it's really like shocking they couldn't come up with like a better, any, and literally any other excuses. I, I could see them saying, well, let's just see if we can run this out a little bit, maybe. Mm -hmm. People can be involved in a different way, right? So in a way, he was obviously an incredibly unsympathetic. He, well, he's both, well, allegedly an abuser, but also potentially a victim of a wider program to get compromised. And if yeah. you want to compromise, you'd want it off someone who was both in a position of incredible privilege and incredibly stupid. And so yeah. to get a sort of hereditary royal, he seems to be the dumbest hereditary royal. That would make sense. <laughs> Um, so at the moment, obviously, this is in the news because Ghislaine Maxwell is now in custody. Um, and we're presuming there are some very powerful people who are pretty nervous um, about what is going to come next. One of them um, is potentially Donald Trump because they've been pictured together. Um, he was asked about this at a press conference this Tuesday. Let's take a look. Ghislaine Maxwell is in prison, and so a lot of people want to know if she's going to turn in powerful people. And I know you've talked in the past about Prince Andrew, and uh, you've criticized Bill Clinton's behavior. I'm wondering, uh, do you feel that she's going to turn in powerful men? How do you see that working out? I don't know. I haven't really been following it too much. I just wish her well, frankly. Uh, I've met her numerous times over the years, especially since I lived in Palm Beach, and I guess they lived in Palm Beach. Uh, but I wish her well, whatever it is. Uh, I don't know the situation with Prince Andrew. Just don't know. Not aware of it. <laughs> it's like he, he employed the same PR firm as Prince Andrew. <laughs> Very bizarre answer. What, what's gonna, what do you think is going to come out, though, of this? She's got a book, right? She's got, has she got videos, CDs? I think there were tabloids reporting that she's got... Well, she's now sort of talking about the fact that she's got pictures and videos of high-profile people with... What, what, what's going to happen over the next couple of weeks? Are we going to get a big revelatory moment, or is it going to be a bit of a damp squib? Well, I, I think I think any revelations we're going to get are probably going to come out of the unsealed depositions or the, the depositions that are being unsealed within this um, this next week. A lot of the tabloid reporting on like she has these DVDs or whatever. I mean, if you look at the actual people they're sourcing them from, they are not the most credible characters in the world. So, I, I you know, I, I would I would. Well, I don't want it to be true because I want it to not have happened. But, you know, I, I if that is true, we'll see. She seemed pretty surprised to be actually picked up in the first place. Liz and I were were present on uh, on on her bail sentencing call. She did not seem overly prepared for what's happening right now. Which I mean, that could be for a variety of reasons. The trial is actually set for a year from now. So mm. you know, in that time, they got to do discovery and they got to you know collect evidence and present to the judge, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I you know I'm not exactly sure how much we'll find out in that time. Hopefully there will be more stuff that comes out. Um, but I would be shocked if she did not have some sort of dead man switch or something. Although from her behavior so far, it doesn't seem like she might be totally ready to push that. And it may not be time to sort of push that button.